Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Raul Loay Samuro. I am Peruvian. I'm a researcher and a professor at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. I've been teaching for almost 20 years in the ecotoxicology and aquatic ecology area. Uh, I'm in love with my career. I enjoy uh, teaching, doing field work, uh, doing research. And uh, now I have uh, this uh, unique and really nice opportunity to uh, talk to Professor uh, Paul Monks. So I hope uh, uh, you will enjoy this interview. Thank you very much, Raul. And, and, and welcome to those who don't know me. I'm, I'm Professor Paul Monks. I'm the Chief Science Advisor at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And I've got the pleasure of hosting uh, these good development uh, conversations and actually talking to some really interesting people from around the world, particularly about their lessons earned. So, so Raoul, you know, uh, welcome to Good Development. How did you find the process of coming up with your lessons earned? Uh, it's, it's very interesting to uh, look yourself uh, into a mirror. Uh, we do that every day, of course, but uh, we don't have uh, the opportunity to ask ourselves about these things. I mean, we all are the result of the things that we learn during our lives. Uh, we are a combination of experiences and uh, lessons uh, taught perhaps by our parents, grandparents, but ourselves. And we learn to uh, combine all of them and make our path. Uh, when I was asked about uh, writing these uh, lessons earned, it took me some time. Although I knew which ones were the, the most important, uh, I figured out that it, there were many. So choosing only eight, a few of them, was a little bit challenging, of course, uh, but it was a very nice exercise and uh, gave me the opportunity to bring uh, all uh, this, uh, I won't say wisdom, of course, but the way in which you see life, the way in which you walk through it every day. So uh, the process was, was really, really smooth. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for, uh, for this opportunity, yes. Absolutely fascinating, yeah. I mean, I, I, I must admit, I have done the, the same process myself. And it was, as you say, it's interesting to reflect on, on some of the principles that underlie the way that you do science and you think about doing science. But one mm -hmm. that particularly struck me was your, was your lesson number four, which was everything has a solution, it's not worth worrying about. I thought it was quite an interesting one. So, so what, do you, what do you mean by, uh, by lesson number four? I always uh, thought that the only thing that has no solution in life is death. Uh, after that, you can solve anything. And what I mean with this is that you never know how people around you, that could be your colleagues, your friends, people that you meet around the corner, can help suddenly to solve a problem that could be stressing you, worrying you. And from one minute to the other, you can find a solution uh, to a problem. Of course, I don't mean that every problem it's, uh, I mean, not worth taking serious, uh, but it's surprising how you can uh, solve them or try to solve them in a very simple way. Sometimes we think about many uh, options or many possibilities around the problem that stresses you, that takes your I would say you're, you're asleep away. And then suddenly you find the answer and it, it was in front of you or it was easier than you, you, you thought before. I had this problem yesterday. Uh, I'm a di director of a school at my university. So, and we are in all this, this week has been all the process of the, uh, how do you say, uh, the registering of the students in yeah. their new semester. And that's a headache. 
every semester is a headache because sometimes the system doesn't work, the registration is not correct, whatever. And we have now in Peru, as also in the UK perhaps, these limitations with the um, number of students you can have in the laboratories for doing practical. And this has uh, lowered the number of people that you can have. So sometimes you have a lot of students interested in a subject. And what can you do? You have to look for more spaces. But suddenly somebody came with a solution that really uh, relieved me. Uh, and it was just so simple, like shortening some practicum and making more serial, like a, 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 a practicum in a day. So it was really easy. If not, it was going to be a really huge problem because all the laboratories at the faculty at the university are already taken. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then I thought again about this number four, something that was really worrying me weeks ago, and I knew it was going to happen, uh, suddenly was solved. And I agreed with it, it was wise. So, so you see, sometimes uh, things come to a good result, a good outcome. Uh, in a non-planned way but it's the best way so it has a link also with another lesson that i have here which is uh, uh not only solving problems and not worrying uh, but you have to be sometimes more practical being perfectionist is not always the best combination so yeah it's a little bit of that well we'll get to we'll get to so the, the english phrase is perfection is the enemy of good um exactly <laughs> but we'll, we'll we'll kind of get to that one a, a, a little bit later actually because I, I think we it'll be interesting how how that links together actually uh, mm. with with that question of don't don't over worry it in some senses there's always going to be a solution out there uh, exactly. um, and it, it is true that we do tend to over worry in science sometimes <clears throat> but there are i think as you said yes. there are some things worth worrying about actually sometimes uh, climate yeah, change sure. being one of them um, um, <laughs> um so which of your lessons was would, would you say was your hardest one lesson look i've been thinking about that and uh i think one with which I always struggle and I'm always learning and saying, ah, oh, come on, you did it again. It's uh, number six. Uh, in Spanish, I will do like a direct translation. It says that uh, you are the owner of what you keep silent and you are a slave of what you say. So, it's it's difficult it's difficult sometimes to uh keep your words and i mean not to be aggressive of course but it's tactical uh, it's strategical to know what you say in the correct time the precise words with the correct person or people words are like swords can have uh, unpredictable effects as I say, for good or for worse. So that's something that it has taken me a lot of time to uh, to try to uh, to handle, to be a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you can be a little bit explosive. But I think that one is is a little bit is a little bit tough. Words can be like a boomerang; they can come back, uh, and you don't know when. Uh, so it's really important to know what you say how you say it and uh, of course try to be empathic something that i try to do always is to be empathic to uh, think on how we as we say on in, in the shoes of the other you know uh, be in the shoes of others uh, and think how they would feel with my words if i would be them uh, and that's something that i think it's a permanent yeah. training in life permanent training yeah See why it's it sort of think before you speak in a way is the. It's, <laughs> it's a, a simple, as simple as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, think yeah before of you course. Speak. But I, I get. I think it's interesting from my own experience. I went on an unconscious bias training course, and yeah. the thing that I really learned from that course was actually when it comes to, uh, you know, as you said, being empathic and thinking about sexism and any other protected character. Yeah, yeah. Actually, stopping and thinking about what you're going to say is a good measure of way of of you know just just that that thought you know am i going to say something that is 
yeah, sexist, not intentionally, but you know, um, you know, and, and or bias. Yeah. You know? so, so I think there's, it's good advice to think before you speak. I think as a scientist as well, you know, I think you were saying earlier that importance of reflection is an important thing. And I think that think before you speak or in your words can have unsuspected effects for better or worse. I kind of like, I like, I like your translation better actually. It has a unsuspected yeah. day is a beautiful phrase uh, as part of that. So I think a very, very, and it is a hard lesson to learn, undoubtedly. Um, yeah. <laughs> one you will necessarily get wrong sometimes, I think. Yeah. And, 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 and then perhaps, Paul, I would say number eight, mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone is challenged every day to do things that could be uh, new and it's natural to fear things that you don't know and to step out of your comfort zone but as yeah. i say fear only exists in our mind i mean mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. human creation it doesn't exist uh, I mean, you can, uh, I know, do parachuting, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, for for instance, I fear, how uh, say, uh, altitude. Altitude, you know? yeah, yeah. Although I work, uh, although I work in the mountains, <laughs> yeah. I work uh, four thousand, five thousand meters, uh, and, and I think that the way, the best way in which you can really overcome and uh, you can uh, go over your uh, th those fears and what you really are scared about is just doing it <laughs> uh, but that, that that's also difficult uh, uh, fearing something it's uh, like having you know like a, a big boulder uh, mm -hmm. tied mm -hmm. to your feet and uh, you cannot move so I think that's also something that uh, we uh, or in my case uh, I should be like a bit more uh, uh, a bit more uh, how do you say uh, uh, like more uh, self-confident, no, uh, mm -hmm. free to do things. Uh, perhaps in time when we get older, uh, there are some things that we fear more. I don't know, but uh, in a way, it's something that uh, I like to work on to uh, recognize what I fear, what are the things that are not comfortable for me. Uh, so just a small uh, example, I'm not a technological guy. I've mm -hmm. never been a technological guy and my parents weren't. So when I was a kid, I'm 47. When I was a kid, uh, I was not familiar with uh, technology. I mean, I read a lot. I love books. I've always read, you know, and uh, I, so I'm most uh, connected to those things, to arts, to music, to, to literature, not technology. But now it's uh, you cannot avoid it. So technology is always a challenge for me. <laughs> so sometimes I think, oh, come on, I have to learn and do this and this. But well, I mean, you have to get along with uh, modern times. Huh? So it's a little bit like that, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's bit, but you never should be afraid of it. I mean, that's the point you're saying. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. Use. Yeah, it's a tool yeah. that we use. and. Uh, I mean, there's always uh, there's always the option to um, um, uh, you know work with somebody uh, brighter who knows how to use that exactly. technology. Exactly. <laughs> yes. It's always, it's always one way out of that problem. <laughs> That's it's, it's, true. That's true. <laughs> but uh, uh, the other lesson we just began to talk about it actually uh, uh, a few minutes ago that perfection is the enemy of practicality. Which again, yes. in a way, in a way, um, um, is a little bit the technology question in some senses as well. So, so what was it? What was what's the story behind your, your fifth lesson around perfection being the enemy of practicality? I'm always delaying, not always, but sometimes I'm delaying important things because I need to have some others done before. Mm -hmm. in a perfect way. I recognize which ones are the, the, the most important things, but because my head works in a perfectionist mood, I I mean, I, I feel like strange if I leave some things apart, not finished or, or not done like as I would to focus on more important things. Of course, the important things, I always take them uh, in a perfectionist way too. And I, I think I do them well, mm. but it's difficult for me sometimes to take a decision and to separate what it should be done first and not, uh, the, as I said, delay 
or or put more attention in small things that of course they could be important but not in that moment or not in a way in which will solve something immediately mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes we often call that the 80 20 rule actually and i I've, I've tried to tutor many of my students in the 80 20 rule which is that 80 -20. often often 80 percent is good enough yeah you know uh, and, and i think in science also you know um you know as, as the laboratory scientist where i started out you know uh, we always just say well let's make sure there's an effect before we try to make the perfect measurement of it <laughs> you know, because you yes, can spend sir. hours taking all these perfect measurements to find out nothing was happening. <laughs> exactly. You know? yeah. So, so in, a, in a way, you know, uh, you have to be careful with perfection. It's, it's an interesting one. It's a, it's a, it's a very important though quality for a scientist because it's that quality control. Yes. And that quality control of, yes. of, of results is an important part of what we do. So getting that 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 that, that eighty twenty or perfection is the enemy of good. I think is, yes. is it's an interesting balance that, that, that we've got to constantly challenge ourselves around. <laughs> it's, it's a good time to, to talk a little bit about your research and just pause for a yeah. moment and talk about your research project, which is Cascada, and which Cascada. I believe stands for Cascading Impacts of Peruvian Glacier Shrinkage on Biogeochemical Cycling and Acid Drainage in Aquatic Systems. So a wonderful, yes. you, you definitely get an acronym prize uh, for Cascada, yeah. <laughs> I have to say. Around that. Can, you t can you tell me a little bit more about Cascada and, uh, uh, and what yes. problem you were trying to address with it? Yes, of course. Uh, well, briefly, uh, the Cordillera Blanca is uh, the most important uh, glacier mountain range, a tropical glacier mountain range in the world. We have around 70% of tropical glaciers in Peru, mostly in an area, a region, which is a, a national park, which is called the Cordillera Blanca, no? like the White Mountains. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing place. It's been recognized all over the world as a very uh, uh, sensible, you know, area because it harbors a huge biodiversity. It's a source of, uh, uh, of, 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 of water, of fresh water for communities, for big cities, for agriculture, economical activities, uh, etc., tourism, etc., etc. But the thing is that also uh, Peru is, is proud of being a mining country from the Incas. Uh, mm -hmm. We've uh, extracted gold, silver, copper, and we are one of the most important producers of uh, zinc, lead, uh, antimony in the world. So what I want to say is that we have a very rich geology. We, have, we are blessed to have a so rich geology. Everywhere you go in Peru and you pick up a rock, there are minerals. So, but this is also, it has, it's a double, how do you say, a double edge uh, knife, because on the one hand, it, uh, it, it makes uh, our biggest profit you know, for Peruvian economy. But on the other hand, it represents a risk that it's being more and more addressed and recognized. And is that when the rocks, uh, like richly mineralized rocks are exposed to, uh, to the atmosphere, uh, a process called weathering, to mm -hmm. oxygen, to water from rain, uh, even from uh, ice melting. There are chemical, biological processes, uh, biogeochemical processes that in, in short produce acid, sulfuric acid, oh. uh, because, because these rocks are rich in uh, pyrite, which is an iron sulfide, uh, the, the fool's gold. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, when pirate is exposed to oxygen and water, it oxidizes. Mm. And this oxidation at the end produces sulfuric acid. And acid is the perfect environment to dilute, to dissolve uh, metals and minerals that are in the rocks. So uh, acid rock drainage uh, has naturally, let's say, polluted these uh, water sources. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, deemed suspected that in the next decades, if uh, glacier retreat 
increases in the Cordillera Blanca, which also has been identified as a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a one of the most vulnerable places in the world uh, uh, to, to climate change and, and global warming, the increase in, in, in acid waters will be uh, each okay. time more. It's a completely natural process. Okay. So it's it's not a completely mining. natural process. Yeah. It has nothing to do with mining, no, or other human activity. No, no, it's completely natural. And that's, uh, but the, the, but at the end, the result is like mining, it's like mining activity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the acidity that you get and the amount of metals uh, mobilized in, in, yeah. in, in fresh water bodies is almost like the one derived from, from mining activities. So that's really interesting. I mean, we, we had a, a few glitches through that, but I, I think, uh, I think just to clarify, I think what you're really talking is about doing bioremediation, I guess, in, in that language, yes. is, is using exactly. the, the, the ecology that you see in the headwaters and applying it as you get this increasing natural phenomena of, uh, of acidification of the, of the waters, putting in uh, managed wetlands or, or engineered wetlands that, that exactly. replicate that kind of bioremediation that you see naturally in that sort of environment. Uh, and on what scale, what scale of bioremediation are you going to need in order to kind of clean, keep the water clean? Well, we have uh, pilot uh, um, uh, wetlands that mm. uh, are now working. Uh, of course, the idea is first to prove that these systems, these constructed engineered systems right. are capable of first uh, uh, retaining metals like through precipitation processes, for instance, but all, uh, but oh, and also be, uh, through uh, uh, phyto phyto remediation with mm -hmm. plants, say with absorption in in the roots in the aerial parts of plants, but also the bacteria that are present in the soils of these wetlands, which are like pools. You no know? water goes through these pools. Uh, this soil uh, rich in this uh, bacteria. Uh, is able to increase pH because what bacteria do is to remove all the sulfates that are in the water. Uh, if you have a lot of sulfates, it will easily transform into sulfuric acid. So uh, what you need to do first is to remove all the, the, the sulfate. And what this bacteria do is reducing the sulfate and they transform it into a sulfide, mm. which on the other hand, is able to capture, to quench metals. So you can, in, on one hand, increase pH by lowering sulfates and, 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 and sulfuric acid, and two, you can precipitate metals. So at the end, you have water that uh, uh, starts uh, and comes from a natural source like a river, for instance, pH three or between five and six a little bit more which can be already used uh, un under under our uh, quality standards peruvian quality standards for instance for uh, uh, cattle rising for agriculture not for drinking of course because that would need a uh, mm. another process of uh, purification of sanitation of course but that would be already a a, a start for a big solution and what we plan or what we think is in a future to replicate these pilots engineered uh, wetlands and build them along uh, this uh, catchment okay. you no know, along this in the cordillera blanca so you can combine the natural functioning of wetlands you no know, and yeah. also this engineered wetlands which can perhaps exactly. produce better yeah. water quality yeah and that and that could be a, a great support for the water facilities in the city because no, uh, the yeah, water I, I really it's a natural bioremediation that uses, exactly. uses nature's solutions it, it, it's it's beautiful in a way so yes. what, what what lesson from your from back to your lessons what, what did you really learn uh, what lesson would you draw from you're, you're working on that project and particularly working with international partners as part of that project. The biggest lesson, and uh, it's something that uh, I always think uh, uh, it's the first one, the first one, uh, mm -hmm. no doubt, is uh, everything comes at the correct time. Uh, mm -hmm. I've worked very hard 
in the last years uh, for building a research group, a laboratory, uh, since I went uh, to the Netherlands to do my, my PhD. And I went there when I was already old. Uh, I finished my PhD when I was 38 years old. So in average, <laughs> that's really uh, far away from what you expect uh, from, from, uh, from young uh, researchers. When I arrived to the Netherlands, I had 34 years old and I was considered the old of the group. But mm -hmm. when I arrived there, I already had a position at the university. I was all, already a professor. I had a laboratory. I had uh, papers published. I had uh, 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 students that I supervised. Uh, so when I arrived there, all that experience that I gained made my PhD much easier. Even my supervisor and co-supervisors, they talked to me in in a, in, a, in a different way. They considered me a colleague because they knew I was a teacher. I was a professor in mm. Peru too. So uh, that's what I mean when I say everything comes at the correct time. And this project Cascada, the way in which I met uh, Professor Gemma Wadam, which is an extraordinary person. Uh, she's a very good friend. Uh, it was it was very curious, of course, because it, this was a meeting between Peruvian and, and British uh, mm -hmm. uh, researchers in glaciers, and we were the only two interested in this topic of acid waters. So we started building Cascada in okay. 2017. Then we finished 2018. We submitted the proposal. Uh, fortunately, we, uh, we, we got the, 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 the support, financial support. Uh, but for me, Cascada is, I won't say the end, of course, of, 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 of all this uh, learning, but it demonstrated me that all what you do in life will have sooner or later a good result. And for me, and I'm, 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 I, I must say that I'm proud of, of having uh, been the leader of Cascada in Peru and uh, demonstrate myself that uh, all what I worked for and mm. passionately uh, at the end uh, uh, had a, a good uh, outcome, a good uh, result. So it just uh, encourages me to uh, uh, continue working hard, you know. I, I'm pretty sure that more good things so I, I will, think it, will I think come. it's a wonderful lesson. It's kind of um, right time, right place, twice. Right it, time, right exactly. place, we went to the Netherlands. Right time, right place, Peruvian UK acid waters. So then that really kind of brings us to the end of our conversation. It's been it's been okay. wonderful to kind of hear about your lessons earned uh, and also a lot about Cascada and how natural bioremediation, you know, we can we can use the, the lessons of nature to to, to self-regulate. I think it's an, a really interesting sort of a lesson. Uh, Raul, thank you very much for joining me on the Good Development Conversations. It's been wonderful to kind of hear about the research, but also about you growing as a scientist and, 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 and the challenges that you face and, and the things that you put into the lessons that reflect that. So thank you very much for joining me and good luck with, with whatever the future brings you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.